Hey everybody, welcome back to the vlog. Thank you so much for once again joining me for Tea Time. Today, we have a little bit of fireside. That smokiness of the Lapsung tea, it's like sitting by a campfire. It's so, so good. It is morning. Normally I'm drinking Misty Morning or some Focus for that zing and bergamot, but I just wanted a little bit of that smokiness this morning. So, this is what we're drinking today. What are you drinking? You have some tea? Have some coffee? Maybe you're on the other side of the planet drinking some rum? Whiskey? Something goody? <laughs> Anyways, guys, today is going to be a Sony day. I just want to talk to you a little bit about the A7 S3, which um, I really, I, I love. I do. I love it. I think it's an awesome, awesome camera. I think they did a fantastic job on it. And today I want to talk to you about who it's good for. All right, and where does it sit as far as photo shooters or video shooters and megapixels, how they make a difference and dynamic range and a lot of stuff. We're gonna go through the specs as of today so that we know these are the specs that are the release specs to make sure that some of the specs that I talked to you about in the past that were rumored, now we have them locked down. So we're gonna tell you what they are just in case you haven't found out as of yet, which you should have because it is on the market as of now, but we want to review so we know what we're talking about. Anyways, I want to say one thing. I want to shout out um, we had a friend of the show, a subscriber, a longtime subscriber, um, was able to see who I was behind a mask <laughs> during a visit to Universal Studios this weekend. Um, that was really amazing. He's like, you're the guy. So we talked for a while. Really, really nice guy. You know who you are. I think you said you go by LV. Um, he was doing a review on a camera. And I want to say that um, if you're seeing this, do me a favor, either DM me or in the comment area, let me know exactly who you are so that I want to send you over an email and then maybe possibly even get you on the show to discuss the camera that you were reviewing. I'm not going to say anything about it as of right now, but I would love to be able to talk to you about it. And if you don't want to go on the show, that's fine, but we'll just talk about what your findings were on that camera. So it was very nice to meet you and have that conversation. I always think it's amazing when I find people that are in the photography industry that see me out and about and they'll say, hey, I know you and we'll get into a conversation. I think that's just absolutely fantastic. Our show has grown to almost 30,000 people now, which is a bunch. I really would like to see that little hundred. We need a hundred more or something to be able to get to that 30,000 mark. How are we going to do it? You're going to subscribe today, right? If you're not, please do so. Subscribe to the channel. We got a lot of good content here. There's probably about 400 videos, a lot of good stuff. Check it out, all right? And if you are subscribed already, click the little bell notification button over here so when I come out with new videos, you'll be notified of it. Or when I go live, you will also be notified of it. So please do so. And if you even like this video just slightly, throw it a big thumbs up. That is helpful, very helpful for the YouTube gods to look kindly on the channel and this video, so please do so. Anyways, we're gonna get right into the A7S 3 talk about its specs, and then where does it stand, and I wanna know what your thoughts are, more than mine, all right? So let's get going. We have a 12.1 megapixel BSI sensor. Its native ISO is 82, 102,400, expandable all the way up to, oh my God, 409,600, which is a ton. How much of that is usable? I'm gonna say probably up to 28, maybe 51,000. That's just my opinion. It's getting 14 stops of dynamic range in photo and 15 stops in video, which is amazing, absolutely amazing. It will do 10 FPS continuous burst rate shooting. That is 10 frames per second. 4K will do up to 120 frames per second. It will do 10-bit 422 internal recording without turning into a pile of magma. 
unlike Canon, but they've fixed that. So we don't want to call them out too much for that. Anyways, next, it will do a full one-to-one pixel readout without binning. That is nice for capturing every bit of that sensor's data. Next, we see 16-bit raw output when recording externally, and it does have 759 points of phase detection, as well as 425 points of contrast detection with 92% coverage. It does have IBIS in body image stabilization that is five access and it does produce 5.5 stops of compensation. It does have a beautiful, probably the best on the market as of today, EVF, which is your electronic viewfinder. That is 9.44 million nine and a half million dots of resolution. That is unbelievable. And to me, what's even better is the 120 FPS. That is 120 frames per second. So you don't get that flicker in your eye because between you, me and the lamppost and anyone else listening, I don't know how good this light is, this blue light, this screen literally sitting a millimeter or two away from your eyeball. In fact, certain wavelengths can trigger eye diseases like cataracts or AMD, age-related macular degeneration. I don't know how good that is long-term, all right? Of course, I am a OVF proponent, but as we go into mirrorless, we have to have that EVF, but I just don't know. I'm hoping that it does not cause any type of problems in the future um, with your retina, with your eye actually sticking it so close, blue light and blah, 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 but we will soon see. Maybe what they'll do is they'll put a screen, some type of blocker or something on that EVF in the future. Or maybe it's there already. I don't know. You let me know because you know more than I do, right? Anyways, back into the specs. It has a three inch 1.4 million dot variable angle touch screen on the back, which is nice. I would like to have seen 3.2, but three inches, basically the norm as of today. Of course, you're going to find dual memory slots, right? Your two card slots, you have your CF Express Type A, as well as SD card. So that is awesome. Also, you have brand new menu designs, as well as, of course, a magnesium alloy body. If you wouldn't, then what the hell would you have, right? For the money, it would be ridiculous. Dust and moisture resistant. And finally, of course, you have your Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, whatever else. Anyways, those are the specs. Now, the things that I want to point out to you guys to try to make this decision on to buy this, the Sony, a7S3 in comparison to picking up like a Canon, for example, R5, which is a better way to go with what you're recording, what you're doing, what are you taking pictures of, what are you doing, right? Number one, I really like to see that dynamic range that Sony is able to produce with this camera. 15 stops over 11 stops is what the R5 is getting. <sighs> Real world, is it a lot? I think so. I watched some of the videos out there of real world, um, what they produce. I took a look at Max's stuff. I looked at DP Review. I looked at a few other people's to see what is being produced. And the dynamic range is noticeable for the most part when it comes to video recording. Those 15 stops compared to 11 stops is nice. The ex that extra little bit does help, especially in the darks, all right? As far as the brights go, yes, you were seeing a little bit less of the blown out areas, but it's kind of a give and take, all right? It's what you prefer when it comes to the look. And that gets me into the base log in comparison to a downloadable log. Now the base log on the Sony is by far better than what I see with the R5. Now, you can download like these Rev 2s, these second um, versions, let's say, or these downloadable versions of log profiles from Canon that do an amazing job. And I think they take them right about on the heels of Sony. I think Sony is definitely winning, but Canon is right there. Now, 
when it comes to resolution, okay, you're talking about a 45 megapixel sensor compared to a 12 megapixel sensor. So in certain circumstances, the video that's being produced with the Canon is by far better if you're looking for something that's tack sharp, just high resolution images, okay? And you wanna like zoom in, zoom out, you're just going to get a better image all right, with that Canon, just because it just has more resolution. There's more pixels there. 12 megapixels compared to 45 megapixels. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we're down sampling from 8K all the way down to 4K and you just, you see the difference. You definitely see the difference. So I would give it to Canon when it comes to resolution. Now, color. A lot of people have always said that Canon just has the absolute best color. And I've said that myself. In this case, I would say that Sony is on par. Some situations it looks a little better, some situations a little bit worse, but remember, color is subjective. It's person to person, what do you like, all right? I still, to this day, prefer the skin tones on Canon cameras over the skin tones over Sony's, Sony cameras. Um, you know, like I said, it's subjective. You look at it, you be the judge, look at a whole bunch of real world shots, and then you decide what you think is better. But remember, like I said, dynamic range is better on the Sony. So if you're shooting a lot of dark stuff, like just really, really horrible lighting, like in a wedding, you'll be able to pull out some of those darks and tone down those brights, right? Those highlights. So where something is blown, maybe in a Canon, you'll be able to bring some of that back or where you're plugging in the Canon, you'll be able to lift a little bit of that darks with the Sony. So. Obviously, you're talking about 12 megapixels compared to 45 megapixels. Once again, if you're doing that wedding and you need the megapixels, Canon is gonna be the way you go. Now, one of the other things that we always talk about is rolling shutter. Now, rolling shutter with the Sony is unbelievable, okay? It does an amazing job. Sony has done a really good job to reduce the amount of rolling shutter that's recorded when you see fast action, all right? Now, if you don't know what rolling shutter is, remember, we're not capturing video um, frame by frame by frame. We're capturing video by scanning over that sensor, over the sensor. The faster that we can scan over the sensor, the less rolling shutter you will get, okay? So, Sony does an amazing job of it, and I said that they were going to be able to do an amazing job with rolling shutter, why? Because you're capturing 12 megapixels in comparison to almost three times that, 45 megapixels. So to capture all those megapixels going across 45 megapixels, that's a ton more data, almost three times the amount of data, right? So I expected there was going to be less rolling shutter when it comes to Sony, and that is absolutely the case. In my personal opinion, Sony producing a camera in 2020 with only 12 megapixels, I really thought that they were going to come out with a global shutter. Now, global shutter, like I said before, captures frame by frame by frame. Literally every pixel every single frame, okay? There is no more rolling shutter, all right? It looks absolutely amazing. And I've always said that eventually, all right, we're going to see a global shutter in all cameras. But right now it's very hard to do because it takes a ton of processing power. Just think about taking all 12 million pixels and reading them out like this at 24 frames per second, 30, 60, 120, did I do that fast? Something like that, you follow me? It is a ton. Now, at 45 megapixels, it's impossible. They're not going to be able to do it until they put literally like, you know, the Whopper inside of the Canon camera. They're not gonna be able to do it. But I really thought that Sony was gonna get there with 12 megapixels, because I know I've seen global shutters already out there at four megapixels, 4.8 megapixels and less. So I thought that they were going to do it this time. And that would have been the game changer right there, period. It would have been end of story, all right? So they didn't do it. 
They didn't do it. Now, I'm going to wait for Canon to do it because I'm going to guess that Canon will probably do something similar to what Sony did and produce something that is very, very video-esque, all right? Whereas with the R5, it is a hybrid. It is a true, as I call it, hybrid, where it does photo, fantastic, it does video, fantastic, and it's a juggle between the two. That being said, Sony at 12 megapixels is more a video camera. It's not really a camera for photo. So the other thing that I saw in one of the videos, I'm not sure if it was your reserve of what, and I think it was DP, uh, DP Reviews video. Um, in some of the video, I saw some of the Panasonic Pulse, okay? The PP, the Panasonic Pulse, where you do that, right? That in and out, where it's, trying to lock on the AF, let's say here, and then all of a sudden it goes back forward, back forward, right? It just for that split second, it gives you that pulse. And I don't see that so much with the Canon. Now, originally we saw a lot of it and they dialed that back and they fixed it um, just tremendously. But at 12 megapixels, I didn't think that we would see any pulse at all. And seeing that Panasonic Pulse kind of had me like, what, what is going on there? I don't get that. Now, if you don't know what it is, like I said, it's that pulsing between foreground and background as it's trying to capture or lock on AF, lock on focus. This is very similar to IBIS, all right? One of my 10 tips in my how to make tack sharp images, right? My ebook that I tell you about. Have you ever downloaded that? If you haven't downloaded, why in the hell not? It's free. Go over to jchristina.com forward slash ebook. Once again, jchristina.com forward slash ebook. 10 tips of making tack sharp images. Go download it. One of the tips, there's a spoiler, one of the tips is IBIS or IS or VR. If you have your camera locked down, all right, you have to turn off IBIS. You have to turn off IS. You have to turn off VR. If you don't, the camera is going to try to stabilize a stable image and it's going to make it less stable or blurry, period. If you didn't know it, now you know it. Download my ebook <laughs> and you'll learn some more. So it feels like the same type of thing with this camera, with the Sony A7S III that's going on. When the subject is just still, not moving at all, and the camera is not moving at all, and you're locked in, it feels like it wants to adjust, okay? Even though it doesn't need to. So what I saw, what they did was they locked onto the subject from the back of the screen and just let it just lock in there. So it didn't have to say, oh, should we go backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, which we, should, you know, what, what do we do? Notorious for Panasonic, right? As I call it, the Panasonic Pulse. Horrible, horrible, horrible. We don't want the Sony Shuffle. <laughs> we don't want that. And I think that they're gonna fix it. Now, of course, you could reduce that time internal to the menus and set it so that that in and out doesn't happen as frequently. You could reduce that time. But what I've seen a lot of people are doing, they're just locking in period. That's good, but it needs to be fixed. This is simple to fix in a firmware update. So I don't think it's anything to worry about, but it's just something to keep, you know, in mind that it is a problem and they will fix it. Just like Canon had a problem with their camera turning into a ball of molten lava and they fixed it to a degree as much as they could fix it with a 8K camera reading out 45 megapixels. Like I said from the beginning, it was going to be a problem unless they ducted it out and they had a fan in it, which they weren't gonna do, right? They need to keep that weather sealing. So that being said, back to costs here now. The Sony is about $3,500, where we see the Canon at about $3,900. So let's call it about a quick little $400 difference. Now, if you're a Sony shooter, then of course, you're just gonna go with the Sony. It's about the same price. If you're a Canon shooter, you're probably going to go with Canon because you already have those lenses, okay? Unless you're coming from DSLR and you don't have RF lenses, then it might be still a decision to make. Do we go with Canon or do we go with Sony? In my personal opinion, I think that if you're going for photo and video, Canon is the way to go. This is a true hybrid. 
and you're getting 45 megapixels. So if you want to shoot a wedding with it, you can do it, but you can also use it for some video here and there, maybe shoot 1080 and not even worry about any kind of overheating. This really doesn't overheat at that point, especially with the new firmware 1.1.1 or whatever it is that you can download. Okay. But if you're shooting video solely, you're a, a video centric type of shooter, I think the Sony is a really good decision at the price for what you're getting. They have amazing, their lenses are awesome. Your G Master glass is fantastic. Every bit as good as Canon, all right? And the price is a little bit cheaper and you're gonna get more stops of dynamic range, okay? It's really good for that. They'll work out any kind of corpse in firmware as, as I said, all right? But remember, if you're looking for this camera as of right now, let me flip over my screen here. As you can see down here, we're seeing we are constantly filling back orders. Let me highlight that. We're constantly filling back orders for this item as of now. New orders placed today will likely ship when? Oh my goodness, November. So we're there already, we're in November. First, so most likely you will be able to get your orders in today and still get them sometime in November. The thing is, is it going to be first week of November or the last week of November? We don't know, but there is a run on this camera or Sony hasn't made enough. There's only two options here, okay? Either the camera is doing absolutely phenomenally or they didn't make enough of them. I don't know the answer to that. We will find out in the rankings probably in the next month or two, and then we'll be able to say which one did better, either the R5 or the Sony A7S III. I'm not really sure, but we're going to know, all right? So coming full circle, A7S III, I think it is an absolutely amazing camera. I think that it is far, far superior to the A7S II, in my personal opinion. I think they've done an amazing job, especially when it comes to their menus. Sony has always had the almost just, to me, god awful menu system, but now it's really, really dialed in. They're doing a much better job when it comes to menus. You have the extra amount of low light capacity in the new one. The megapixels are all the same, so you're not dealing with anything different there. You're just getting, I personally think, a better machine for literally about the same cost of the A7S II when it came out. So it is a really good upgrade. That's my opinion. Now, as far as the Canon R5 goes, remember, it is a Rev1. I personally don't buy Rev1 cameras, okay? I let someone else do the beta testing for me. I will buy a Mark II of that camera or skip it and possibly buy the very first time a Rev1 of anything and that would be a R1. The reason being is because Canon would now have a lot of experience as far as overheating with the R5, dealing with a lot of megapixels. The R1 will have half the amount of megapixels or possibly less because of what it is. It will be a professional based just machine that will do an amazing job for us professionals. It will be a 1D replacement. So. That being said, I think that if, once again, if you are a Sony shooter, the A7S III is a fantastic decision. If you are a Canon shooter, the R5, even though it is a Rev1, I wouldn't purchase it. I still think that it is a good decision just because of where it is as of today, dollars for dollars. Because a lot of the people that are buying the R5 are basically buying a mirrorless version of a 5D. And those people really don't care about video. All right, remember Canon has created the R5 as that 5D, but it is also created as a revolution, just like they did with a 5D Mark II, where you're able to capture cinematic 24P amazing video, 1080P at the time was just, just unbelievable. It was like one of the first cameras to be able to do it, do it well with high-end glass, very cheaply. Okay, that's what they were doing with the R5. So is it going to have some, let's say some growing pains? It will. For me, I would wait for a Mark II, but if you're already a Canon user, it might be the way to go if you have RF glass, or if you don't mind marrying your EF glass to the RF using an adapter. 
So guys, I wanna know what your thoughts are on this. What do you think about the Sony a7S III in comparison to a Canon R5? What is more, let's say in line with what you're shooting, what is better for you? What would be a better camera for you, regardless if you're buying it or you're not buying it? Are you more photocentric or are you more video centric? Do you believe, like I said, I personally think the Canon is a hybrid, a true hybrid that does video and photo well, whereas Sony, whereas it does do photo okay, you're still only getting 12 megapixels. And if you're doing a big album or something, or you wanna blow something up large, or you need to really get in there down deep and dirty, let's say, and do some pixel pushing, it's gonna be an issue at 12 megapixels, all right? That's why I shoot medium format for all of my fashion stuff or my high-end production product shots. Why? Because we need to have a lot of megapixels to be able to push around. So let me know your thoughts. What do you think? Once again, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have, throw it a big thumbs up. That would be absolutely stellar. And like I said before, smash that subscribe button so you get all my content when it becomes available and click the bell icon right around here. So when I do go live or when a new video comes out, you will be notified of it immediately. And don't forget to download that ebook, jchristina.com forward slash ebook. Once again, jchristina.com forward slash ebook. And finally, head over to my website, jchristina.com, where you can find all the photography tools that I've invented for you and me over the years. And hopefully there's something there that you might like. And if there is, please pick it up and support me and my family. That would be absolutely awesome. Don't forget also to join us over at community.jchristina.com. That is our creative Discord server that we created for you and me, both of us, both of us. We can hang out. There's a lot of brilliant people over there. Don't forget to visit community.jchristina.com. Once again, it's free, like the ebook. Free, 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 free. <laughs> and finally, if you are a subscriber, use promo code YT20 at checkout. Once again, YT20 at checkout over at jchristina.com. Pick up any of my photography tools that I've made over the last decade and a half for 20% off just for being here and subscribing. That would be awesome. I'm out of here, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe and stay healthy.